Everybody. Welcome. Um, here we are again, celebrating International Working Women's Day. And um, we want to say, and let you know, in case you don't know, how important women are in this world. We are very, very necessary. Okay. Not just for procreation and survival of the species, but we're also the peacemakers, the caregivers, the caretakers. We're also the workers, we're the educators, all of us. Okay. We are, remember, you are important women. You will always be. Uh, last year we celebrated the um, the life of Harriet Tubman. Yes. You know, yes, yes. Our freedom fighter, okay. Our liberator, our role model. We have another role model here with us today. Another freedom fighter, another courageous woman, another liberator, okay. Another spirit who's so necessary in this world, and she is here with us by the name of Liz. Lynn was released from prison on January 1st. So um, this is another celebration. We had a big one last month. A home. She's returning home. Okay, and she's here with us. She's returning back to the International Action Center. Okay. And um, Lynn's going to say a few words. Okay, and you do know how much we love you, right? Texas phrase that you all <laughs> know I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. You and uh, there's a guy in the back there somewhere in the gray shirt <laughs> wow. that yeah. stood in front of the White House, a term he despises, but at any rate, uh, in the 104 degree weather of summer in D.C., carrying my picture and talking to everybody who would listen to get me to come back home and mighty Goliath fell and right. here I am today yeah. uh, <laughs> for the last month he and I have been haunting the Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security and you name it of Brooklyn we are these places which are somewhat like being in jail in the sense that you're so regulated, they're so cold, they're so forbidding. The people are not particularly friendly, but after total perseverance and never giving an inch to them and following through and getting the papers and doing what they wanted, yesterday we went down on Atlantic Avenue and we were told that I do have Medicaid. And while we are very happy about this, it just points out how much we lost when we didn't fight harder for single payer. Right. No one should have to go through two months of constant bickering, constant keeping up with them in order to get treatment. And I was not going to get treatment until I got medical coverage through, and I can say, it, we don't need to go into it, no fault of my own. Somehow or other, you're in prison, they cut off your Medicare and you're supposed to apply again. Hello, how do you know? I'm in Texas, for heaven's sake. But anyway, I'm back and I'm happy and uh, I'm Western enough, I guess, to say that uh, just knowing there's a doctor out there, someone who knows my name, Aside from my own relatives, that is, uh, uh, is really a great relief and a great comfort. Well, I'm so happy to be here for International Women's Day. I have been here before on International Women's Day, but the first time on 24th Street for me. I haven't been to 24th Street yet. So this is indeed a pleasure, and of course the turnout is just wonderful. And we're not going to blame it on the weather. We blame everyone. Well, there's no turnout. Oh, it's the weather. Well, it was a great day out there. And we're here, and we're here to make ourselves heard and be seen. And I just, I do want to just raise a, a couple of things. First of all, 
we have to remember, and I became very aware of this in the wonderful letters and, and cards and everything else I got when I was in prison, and my mail, I think, was a big factor in getting me out of that place. Because the day before they released me, I got no less than 87 pieces of mail <laughs> from all over the world, from all over the country, all saying the same thing, you know, and, and it's saying uh, everything from the law students who said, I want to be a lawyer just like you, and from the 87-year-old people who say, I'm 87, but I still get out there, you know, I, it just was a remarkable outpouring. And I think that it had to have influenced the prison authorities. They didn't want me in. They didn't want me out either. But I think they figured I was a lot less dangerous out than I would be in, especially if they cut off my medical care. But anyway, uh, I, here I am, and I'm very, very happy to be here. And it is, as I said at our, our Valentine's Day special, that... Uh, Without everybody pulling together, it never could have happened. And I'm talking about liberals, I'm talking about radicals, I'm talking about super radicals, I'm talking about the, uh, the uh, I don't know what's the name for it, that the left always has to call the people that are way out on the fringe. People who are way out on the fringe. Um, I have to speak, learn to speak in the microphone, though, you're right. And I remember last International Women's Day, I spoke to a, just a small group of people in Carswell, and they sort of glazed over after I got through with the first two lines. You know, this is not fertile field as it once was to start organizing in prisons, especially since we know what, how heavy the penalties are for doing so. But I do want to say that uh, left behind me at Carswell are two women both of whom are in the maximum security, which I was not. But I speak, of course, of Afra Siddiqui, a Pakistani Shiro, who stood up and confronted the United States Army, and then they quite literally framed her, saying that she picked up the officer's rifle and fired it at him. Uh, if she did, God bless her. If she didn't, God bless her too. Right. Well, all we know is that uh, there was no ballistics evidence in Afra's trial to prove that that rifle had ever been fired. Not unlike uh, someone else whose button I wear on my jacket, Leonard Pelletier. All the ballistics are in his favor. All of the evidence, I may say, is in his favor, and yet they will not let him go. Um, the other person, of course, at Carswell is Marie Mason, another facet of our movement, the echo terrorists, as they call them. Marie is doing 22 years. She raided uh, animal clinics. She stood up against the University of Michigan for their experimentation. Uh, she was full-time, she was serious, and they gave her 22 years in prison for her activism. All of these people, and as I say, we may be talking a little bit here about people we don't always talk about, and I would also include the many, many Muslim prisoners that are have been framed who are sucked into plots of the FBI's making to keep the FBI on the front pages while they lock up young men who are really guilty of nothing but maybe an aspiration or two, or who have a legitimate reason to maybe join a group, which nobody wants to pay any attention to that. Anyway, they are issues we have to think of on this International Women's Day. Also, I just want to raise very briefly that there are people among us who are aging and whose stories have yet to be told in any meaningful way. I think of people like Frances Golden. I think of people like Frances, yes, and, and her championing of, of Ariane Rich and also uh, her own work in, in Mumia, etc. Uh, also, a person that may not be known to you because she's not part of 
this part of the movement, which is another thing we're all going to have to get over sooner <laughs> or later, but I'm talking about Lillian Pollock, who was 99 years old. She's living on the Upper West Side. She's one of the raging grannies, and, and yes, she was in Mexico City with Trotsky. She knows this stuff firsthand. We need to tap these resources. All these lovely young people here need to hear from people who have gone through a lifetime commitment to this struggle. And let me tell you, it makes all the difference in your life to be committed to struggle, to know that you're on the right side of history. And of course, I do want to say that we always have to be on guard for the way in which our government likes to manipulate us as women uh, and uh, it, uh, use their patriarchal ways. Uh, they are the great white father, and I mean great, and I mean white, and I mean father. Uh, <laughs> they basically, they will tell you, we're going into Afghanistan to protect the women from the terrible Muslims, from Islam, which is enslaving them. We are doing this for the women, says George Bush. Well, let me tell you, and if you haven't explored this already, it's not a bad thing to think about or to find out about. The women under Islam may indeed be a lot better than women under capitalism. At any rate, food for thought, food for thought. And we also, and I consider this the cruelest manipulation, and maybe it has not so much to do with women, and I'm going to say that, that Ralph in his 80th birthday speech, which he is preparing for his birthday party, which I am throwing for him and oh, Betty Davis. Uh, that'll be in March 26th, I'll come back to that, but he is preparing to speak on a subject that I'm just gonna introduce. And that is that in a period of time when no one can ever say that the white America was not at war with black America, the young men who picked up guns to defend themselves, to defend the community, yes, and to defend the women as well, that this has now been branded as such a heinous crime that we cannot even talk about it, that the only people who are good guys are the ones who were pacifists. But let me tell you, the true heroes are in our jails, 200 strong, have been there for years. Marshall Conway just got out. Let's hope the ice will begin to crack because we need to bring them home. They are our heroes, and we cannot let them manipulate us by saying, oh, there's a dead cop, oh my God. Bruce Wright, who I don't know whether many of you remember, he was a great judge in this city. He said, we don't make such a big deal if somebody goes out and kills a, a Nobel laureate, but if you kill some dumb cop, that's a big deal. Well, we understand why. We understand what a threat that is to the system that they have sworn to uphold, which we are sworn well, we're not sworn, but we are, we are interested in the demise of that system. At any rate, I do think we have to say that this is something that we have to think about because as long as they can manipulate this, as they just did in the denial of the appointment as, uh, as Assistant Attorney General, uh, oh, no, I, I forget the title, but it's in charge of civil rights, Department of Justice, yes. Uh, if they can manipulate that situation, they can manipulate any situation. And of course, I see parallels to myself. You take an upstanding lawyer doing the right job for the right people, at least who you consider the right people, and you manipulate into saying, that lawyer is those people. You come tainted because they say you're tainted. I must have said a thousand times, my causes are not the causes of the sheikh, but yet I still, that's what ended me in jail. But at any rate, I would just want to say we have great things to look forward to this year. We're having this wonderful birthday party on the 26th of March. 
I'm sure you'll be notified about it more times than you care to be. <laughs> but we will have birthday cake. It'll be fun. We will have, and of course, I have to say, uh, uh, we are going to have a presentation by modern day John Brown, Norman Thomas Marshall. We're doing that because Ralph absolutely adores and respects and admires both Norman and John Brown. And of course, music from that great guitar playing teenager, <laughs> Miss Serafina Brown, who brought you revolution at the Valentine's Day and who just happens to be our granddaughter. <laughs> so it will be a very fun evening. We will have a lot of good speeches, short, shorter than this one. and. Uh, <laughs> I am so happy to be among you, so happy to see these faces, these people. It is a joy to my heart. And I tell you, I am i couldn't, uh, don't let me get carried away here, but I am carried away. And thank you all, and love you, love you, love you. Thank you. Everybody, give it up.